The entire road had become a long parking lot. There were clusters of cars at lights, lights that weren't working. Standing around the cars were more people, equally confused, but also angry looking. An old truck, again almost as old as my car, rumbled along slowly, weaving past the stalled cars like they were pylons. The driver looked at me and waved. I gave a little wave back as if we were members of some sort of secret club. I moved over to the far side of the road to get around cars that had clumped together blocking the way. This was eerie. So you think this is some sort of computer problem, Lori said? Like a virus? Yeah, a virus of some kind, a bad virus. But how was it spread so that it infected the cars, Todd asked. I have no idea. Maybe through the airwaves. You mean like Wi-Fi and the internet, he asked? Well, maybe that's how the computer at schools got infected. But the car computers aren't hooked up to the net. Maybe it was through GPS or satellite radio or even OnStar car systems. Though well, that makes sense. Almost every car has one of those, Todd agreed. But not all of them. It has, something, it has to be something else as well. And then the answer came to me. Every car has a radio. It could be through AM or FM signals. That could be how the virus arrived and then infected the entire computer system. Do you know what this reminds me of? Todd asked. I had no idea. This was like nothing I had ever seen or heard about. What? Laurie asked. This is going to sound stupid. Look around, I said. Compared to what's happening, nothing could sound stupid. It reminds me of one of those movies where the only human beings in the world drive around in cars with zombies chasing them. He paused. Okay, now tell me if that isn't stupid. I shook my head. Not stupid. I think I even understand. I came up to an intersection, easing through the stalled vehicles, my progress marked by looks of awe or surprise from those standing beside their disabled rides. I'd gone from driving an old piece of crap to piloting an object of wonder. Chapter 3 Rachel and Danny followed me out to the doors of their school. The principal had been thrilled to have me take them. He had hundreds of kids with no school buses and almost nobody to pick them up. Taking two fourth graders off his hands made his job that much easier. The kids were still thinking it all had to do with the power going off. I was positive the power going off wasn't the cause of the problem, but the result of the problem. I hope everything is still blacked out tomorrow, Danny said. It would be sort of like a snow day without all the snow. I laughed. Maybe it really was nothing serious and I was overthinking all of this and it would be fixed in a few hours. That made sense. Power failures happened and then things were repaired. That's how it worked. Except then, when the lights went out, there usually was a storm or something, knocking down power lines and causing outages. I also knew this was more than just about the power, but I didn't say anything. There was no point in worrying the twins by opening up questions when I didn't have answers. Our teacher told us about a blackout that hit the eastern half of North America a few years ago, Danny said. I kind of remember that, Lori said. It was freaky and a little bit scary. You have me and Adam, so there's nothing to be as scared of, Todd said. A scared? Danny asked. Who taught you how to talk? Great, I'm being disrespected by a fourth grader, Todd said. A smart fourth grader, Danny said. Rachel laughed. Not that smart. Do you think this blackout could be that big? Danny asked me. I'm not sure about anything, I said. Our teacher said that it took three days to fix that big one. Maybe there won't be school for the rest of the week, Danny said. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be amazing, Todd agreed. 
Nothing could be more amazing than what we were witnessing. People had started to abandon their vehicles as they realized that they weren't going to start up, that there was no way to call for help, and that even if they could make a call, there was nobody to help them since the emergency vehicles would be stalled too. People would have been sitting in their cars, were on their feet walking. This was strange to see because nobody in our suburbs ever really walked anywhere. There were streams of people hiking down the middle of the street, more obstacles in my way. Most people just looked at us, but others waved, and a couple stuck out their thumbs trying to hitch a ride from us. There's another car, Danny screamed. Another old junker was coming towards us. The driver leaned out his window and waved to us. As he came to a stop, I pulled up beside him and halted when we were window to window. Old car, I said, pointing at his vehicle. We're the only things that seem to be running. How far have you come? He asked. Only a couple of miles. And is it like this all over? He asked. As far as we've seen, we're, where are you coming from? Milton. I've been driving for 30 miles and it's like this everywhere I've passed through. I figure the only way my wife is getting home from work is if I get her. She's one of the lucky ones who'll get a ride home, I said. Be careful. He gave me a strange look. You know, drive carefully. There are so many abandoned cars, I said, but that wasn't what I meant, and I think he knew it. I had an uneasy feeling about the way people had been looking at us as we passed. There was something in their eyes, especially the last guy who tried to wave us down. He looked angry when I didn't stop. What happens to 16-year-old Adam Daly and his friends after the shocking afternoon when computers around the world shut down in a viral catastrophe? Read Eric Walter's Rule of Three, where a person can last three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food. Available in our school library.